So welcome to our session on historical review of cochlear implantation. When I was initially asked to moderate this session, I thought, being me, I would come in with two EMTs and a stretcher, maybe an oxygen mask on my, on my face to show how long I'd been around, but I decided that probably wasn't a good idea, although I, I kind of thought it was funny. Um, I'm really actually very honored to be um, moderating this session, and I'm really honored to be with such a distinguished panel. I've been around for a fairly long time, almost 40 years. I've seen cochlear implants go from investigational devices to a mainstream treatment, and that's really disrupted the cochlear implant field, especially for, for audiologists. Um, I've seen postlingually deafened adults be able to converse with their families again. I've seen congenitally deaf children who were implanted before the age of a year to, to not let be defined by their deafness any longer and become really citizens of, the soci of society, being physicians. And I program the patient's process so they can, so they can hear on a stethoscope. So it's incredible what we've all in this room done over the last 30 to 40 years, including, as I said, our distinguished panel. We're, we don't have any slides because back in 1984, there was no such thing as the slides on computer. It was all something called Harvard Graphics and you had a slide deck, so we're gonna pay respect to, to 1984. I wanna begin um, by introducing our distinguished faculty. Uh, to my immediate left is Mario Sversky. Dr. Sversky is the Noel Cohen Professor of Hearing Science at NYU. He's also the leader of the Lab for Transi Transitional Auditory Research. Dr. Rich Miyamoto is um, a professor emeritus of otolaryngology from Indiana University, and he was involved in very early on in some of the clinical trials that I think he's going to um, talk to us about. Um, Jan Larkey is the um, audiology director of the Cochlear Implant Center at Stanford, and she's actually a master clinician. She, she told me to say that, right? You told me to say that. Um, <laughs> and she's been working with kids and adults um, since 19, 1992. Ellen Thomas, sitting next to, to Mario, is a SLP, um, who is an ABT therapist whose specialty is in pediatrics. She is a senior SLP um, at the University of Michigan, and she's been doing this, I think, since 2003. Is that, is that correct? At Michigan. At Michigan. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, Donna Sorkin, as you know, is the executive director of the ACIA. And so she's gonna be talking about her role as the executive director, but also as a role as a, a patient. And so she has actually two, two hats that she's gonna be taking on. And um, so let's start um, by talking to Mario. Mario, you've been tasked with talking to us about technology and how over the last 39 or 40 years, technology has changed. You have, I think, your degree in electrical engineering, you're interested in uh, speech perception, speech production, so tell us a little bit about your thoughts about how the field has changed from a technological point of view. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I think one, one way about thinking how things have changed over the last 30 years, uh, and indeed, I've been in cochlear implants since 1984. My first subject for my dissertation was Lucian Weber, the very first cochlear implant user in the state of Louisiana. Uh, he appeared in the town newspaper wearing a t-shirt saying, I'm number one. Uh, it was a great subject. Uh, a few years later, something very important happened. Um, I'm talking about the Veterans Administration study that was led precisely by Noel Cohen uh, and Susan Waltzman and a collaborator from NYU. What they did was to conduct what I think was the first prospective randomized trial of cochlear implants. And they evaluated the main three devices that were available at the time. Those were the inner aid device. This was an analog device that used a plug to go through the skin rather than electromagnetic transmission, a percutaneous plug. Uh, it had four active channels and it delivered an analog waveform to each one of those channels. Uh, the other one was the single channel 3M Vienna, which was uh, the predecessor uh, to the multi-channel metal devices. Um, the, um, 
And lastly, there was the cochlear device, which at the time I think used the F not F1, F2 strategy. Uh, the philosophy at the time for cochlear was feature extraction. Rather than send the whole signal to the brain and let it deal with it, uh, try to extract what might be most relevant. Uh, so this study was very influential in a number of ways. Number one, it established beyond a shadow of a doubt that uh, multi-channel devices were better. Uh, and this may be super old news to you, but there was a vigorous debate at the time. You know, I remember my friend Inga uh, standing up at every meeting saying that it's not that clear that you know, multi-channel is better than single channel. Uh, and I think uh, I agree with Inga that it was interesting why is it that the 3 m Vienna single channel device seemed to result in such better outcomes than the 3 m house device? I don't think that's a question that we have answered to our satisfaction. That's moot in a sense, now that the Cohen and Waltzman study established, okay, multi-channel is better. Uh, and it's interesting to see that over the years, you know, the compressed analog strategy used by the inner array device was replaced by the CIS strategy in a study conducted by uh, uh, Blake Wilson and colleagues at the Research Triangle Institute and by Don Eddington at MIT. I was a part of that team as well. So the, the inner aid moved into uh, the CIS strategy that became a standard. Uh, the single channel was essentially phased out. The, um, percutaneous plug of the inner aid went away to the dustbin of history. Uh, and the cochlear strategies evolved from feature extraction to presenting all the information uh, pretty much like CIS does. Uh, so it's fair to say that today when it comes to stimulation strategies, uh, all devices use pretty much the same thing. Uh, and of course, people from each company are going to jump and say, no, but we have this, we have that. That's true. Uh, but they all use CIS or some version of it, whatever they call it. You know, what's ACE for cochlear is N of M for uh, Merel. Uh, and the name N of M is good because it reminds us if, if we implement an N of M strategy where N equals M, that is exactly CIS. Um, and there are other examples of convergence. If we look at devices 30 years ago, there were, over the years there were many opinions about what the input dynamic range should be. Should the device try to capture 30 dB of acoustic dynamic range, 45, 60? Uh, Advanced Bionics invested tremendous resources to achieve an engineering tour de force, have an input dynamic range of 80 dB. Uh, so, you know, there used to be a range of 30 to 80. However, over time, Cochlear realized that there was enough information that they should move to a higher IDR. And right now, they are in the ballpark of 45. And Advanced Bionics retreated from 80, so their effective IDR, maybe no more than 60 or so. So that's another example where uh, Cochlear implant companies are converging. And they're also happening to use about the same frequency range for their maps. They have converged on that over the years. Uh, that's not to uh, say that there aren't very important differences among devices. Uh, of course, Merel has fine structure. It tends to have longer electrodes that can stimulate more places in the cochlea. AB is a device that's tremendously flexible although that flexibility is not used in current uh, strategies. Um, yes, there are differences, but there has been a convergence that I think has been a healthy process. That brings up the question, when I see a patient and talk to them about devices, I might say, well, this company has more electrodes, but this company has a faster repetition rate. And can you talk about that a little bit? You think there'll be a day where we could say, you know what, you need this device, and mm -hmm. based on the testing we've done, you should get that device, and maybe this ear should get that device, and that ear should get this device. Do you think there's any um, reason to be doing those kinds of things? Just say uh, yes. It's I don't know if we'll get to that day, because uh, you know what we have is healthy competition amongst manufacturers. Um, so when one comes up with something that seems to give them an edge, uh, 
you know, the others try to match that as best they can. I mean, sometimes patients make decisions as to which device to get because they like to swim a lot. So they want the device that works best in the water uh, or the one that has the best battery life. These considerations are important, but they're not make or break. What about the feeling that a longer electrode array is a better electrode array? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a possibility, and there are some uh, data suggesting that somewhat longer is somewhat better. Um, of course, if you have residual hearing, there's also the possibility that somewhat longer might result in less residual hearing, and that's a trade-off that's not easy to, to navigate. Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, does anyone on the panel have a question? You want to bring something up for Mario? We can move on. Either way is fine. OK, so Dr. Miyamoto, you've been involved um, for a while in the first investigational devices. Why don't you talk a little bit about history, and then maybe in the middle I may ask you a couple of questions about surgery and how it's changed. Thank you. Well, the cochlear implant uh, clearly has evolved into one of the most significant advances in medicine, but <clears throat> it clearly didn't start out that way. And uh, most of us here had our start when it wasn't thought to be such a good idea. Uh, the normal ear has about 30,000 nerve fibers, and uh, the uh, neuroscientists thought it would be totally uh, impossible for any electronic device to give a patient enough hearing to make it worthwhile. So this is the way we all started. But um, I remember back in my days as a medical student at the University of Michigan and later as a resident at Indiana University, uh, there was no treatment for profound sensory neural hearing loss. And that was very frustrating to us as clinicians to have nothing to offer. So this all changed uh, after I uh, started my fellowship in Los Angeles with Bill House. He was starting his early studies with single channel implants and um, introduced me to the cochlear implant concept. Um, after I left the House Institute to join my faculty position at Indiana, Bill uh, contacted me and asked if I would be one of his co-investigators on uh, the first ever clinical trial for uh, cochlear implants. And I was, of course, uh, enthused about this, but I didn't know for sure it was going to work. But our, our very first patient was the uh, mother-in-law of one of my residents at the time. She came up from Florida to Indianapolis and uh, uh, became our first patient. And uh, she told me, uh, Dr. Mimono, if you can do one thing for me, um, my life will be complete. I want to be able to hear my grandbaby cry when she's born. And uh, I thought, well, this is a interesting goal. Uh, you don't have to have normal hearing. There's a lot of hearing that ranges from no hearing to normal hearing. And she just wanted to hear a grandbaby cry. And so we did her cochlear implant in 1979. The uh, protocol then was we had to identify a patient, uh, bring the patient to Los Angeles and do the surgery with Bill House, and then come back home and do the rehab in our own institution. Well, she could hear her grandbaby cry, and she could do a lot more. She could actually talk on the telephone. Her, her speech was normal. Uh, she used a phone code, but uh, after seeing this first patient, I realized that there's something really important going on here. Uh, we have a life-changing technology, and th this needs to be explored. So we developed um, our um, protocol for a, a group of uh, postlingually deafened adults, and they were all adults at this time. And uh, we did this series, and I was asked to um, report this series to the FDA in Washington. And uh, shortly thereafter, after they had a lot of discussions about the pros and cons of implants, but they, they heard some of these uh, early clinical results and uh, approved cochlear implants. So in 1984, um, cochlear implants became an approved FDA product. And this changed things tremendously for us because now insurance companies started paying for it. Um, before, we did all our studies with donated money from private organizations, wherever we could get it. Um, but we got this first set of patients put together and uh, demonstrated a concept. But from this, um, it was very interesting. During my discussions with the FDA, um, there were always some people around the room who I didn't know. Well, it turned out one of the people was Erlene Elkins, who was in charge of the hearing portfolio for NIH. And um, after it got approved, she called me and she says, Rich, we're very interested in what you're doing at Indiana University. Will you send me a grant? 
Now, it's not often someone from NIS calls and asks you to send a grant, but she did this. So I sent it in, and um, they started funding our research uh, from 1987, and uh, they continue to fund our research for the next 25 years. So uh, this is how so much of the early work got done. Um, what happened in our program, um, once we got approval, I had parents come in, and they wanted their deaf child implanted. We didn't have a pediatric program, but we thought we needed to start one. So we uh, started a pediatric program. And I remember her father asked me, if Janie has one of these cochlear implants, is she going to learn to talk? And I, I didn't know the answer to that. Um, I didn't know if she would get anything at all. But we thought, whatever the answer is, we need to find it out. So we set up a, a very sophisticated team who knew how to um, evaluate deaf children and evaluate their speech and hearing concepts. Well, what happened, um, many of these advances required some modifications in our surgery. So as a surgeon, uh, I spent a lot of time figuring out how can we make these devices work in small deaf children. Their heads were small, and uh, we didn't have the uh, freedoms we had in, in planning adults, but we had the same device. So we had to make several uh, modifications. Now, one of the uh, early modifications that came out of our implant research was um, uh, everyone knows you just put the little device and it sticks on their head. Well, when we started our research, uh, that didn't exist. We had an um, implantable device, but you had to match up the external coil, and it didn't work that way. Uh, so it was very interesting. These patients would come in and say, well, you're deaf, you need a cochlear implant, so I'm recommending that. And uh, we're going to send you to the ophthalmologist to get glasses. Well, they go, well, what in the world? I came in deaf, and you're sending me your glasses. Well, we had to mount the external coil on there. And that, that was a real problem. But Jack Huff came up with the little magnet that all the devices have now that self-centers the device. So that, that was one of the major things that certainly made fitting children a whole lot easier. Um, Bill House had us make a large flap early on to cover the device. And for the little children, we couldn't make the large incision. So we gradually start uh, reducing the size of uh, the incision. And uh, we ended up uh, doing a little retro incision just large enough for the device. We had to get enough for the device to go in and do a mastoidectomy, but that's all the room you needed. So our incision got smaller and smaller. And um, then we started making a little periosteal pocket just to tuck the device up because the uh, implant companies uh, made their devices smaller and flatter. So we could do this. We didn't have to make the um, big incision to embed the implant. We used to drill a big well and use tie over stitches. Well, we didn't have to do any of that. Um, we just made a little pocket and moved it up there. And then we developed a little shallow well just to hold it up there. But then I put bone pate underneath. So that made this all uh, feasible to do in, in children. So this uh, really changed things. The, uh, all these small changes in surgery uh, saved us a lot of time in the operating room, so it really cut our operating time way down. So I just thought I'd just tell you what happened to some of these little children. Um, we started an infant research project uh, years ago, and um, my youngest patient was only six months old when we did his implant. I remember the mother called me from um, Augusta, Georgia, and said her child had uh, filled his newborn screen he had, uh, had a positive connection test and um, failed a hearing aid trial and needs a cochlear implant. And I said, well, it sounds like where we are, but uh, I asked, well, how old is he? And she said, well, he's three months old and he's ready to go. Well, we weren't ready to do three-month-olds, but I, I agreed to do him when he was six months old. And uh, he grew up with his cochlear implant, went to regular school, and uh, went to college. And uh, he is, um, I just talked to the father a couple weeks ago, He's an aeronautical engineer having a degree from Georgia Tech. Uh, how often did deaf kids do this before? They just never did. Um, what we started doing, though, uh, since it worked well for the little children, we started using the same surgical modifications in our adults. And uh, uh, even our older patients, we could make small incisions and tuck it up in there and do it quick, quicker. So with, with that technique, our age range was between six months and 92 years. Even our older people needed to hear and uh, they would uh, take advantage of this. This made a, a real big difference. And then as far as performance, um, one of our own residents um, 
had cochlear implants. He went through medical school with a cochlear implant. He finished our residency with a cochlear implant and went through our NIH training grant. And he's now a uh, practicing otolaryngologist who does his own cochlear implants out in the West Coast. So I, I think this is a pretty good uh, uh, testimony for this thing really does work. So I think uh, the real advantage is the, the, as a surgeon, um, our job was to put the device in place and get it in place. But the people who really drove the process after that are the rest of the team. And they're well represented on this panel. And it's so important to have the rest of the team there. And uh, I'm going to turn it back to you so that the rest of the team can tell what they do. Well, thank you. That was really very interesting. I have a question for you, though. Um, I think one of the things that stops patients from getting a cochlear implant is their fear of surgery. You hear that pretty often. And so there are some places that are doing surgery under local anesthesia now. How do you feel about that? Um, issues? What, what can you tell me about that? Well, I think at Riley Hospital, we're blessed with having really sophisticated pediatric anesthesiologists uh, and uh, our adult anesthesiologists are fine. So we usually just follow the practice. If, if you were healthy enough to have an elective procedure, uh, our anesthesiologists could help us. But um, a, a local anesthesia can be done. There's no question about yeah. it. But we didn't have that much uh, difficulty. Some of our patients thought we were putting this little electrode in someone's brain, so they thought we were doing brain surgery with right. the cochlear implant. Well, that's not the case. But uh, I, I think that local anesthesia is something that can be done. But I think that uh, for most of us, it's better just to have the patient sleep and have them not wake up during the procedure, which sometimes happens. Got it. So the, the last question I have for you is about the portfolio of electrodes. When we started, if you got this device, you got that electrode. If you got this device, you got that electrode. Now each company has a portfolio of electrodes. I think you've, we've seen that as a real boom to maybe hearing preservation. So can you just talk for a minute about maybe your thoughts about hearing preservation with electrode arrays? Yeah, we, we've participated in some of the hearing preservation protocols. And uh, I think, to me, as a surgeon, all of us think, you don't want to make your patient worse than they were before they started. And any time you operate on an ear, there's a possibility that something could go wrong and you could lose some residual hearing. So I worked real hard to make sure that if we did uh, one of these preservation procedures, we could put the device in safely. And uh, fortunately, I didn't lose hearing on any of my patients that we did hearing preservation surgery. So it can be done. But I think I was interested in... Uh, longer electrodes that uh, were flexible they could put in a little deeper because I know Bruce Gantz did a lot of work with a short electrode and there were some advantages just to having a little longer electrode but when you have longer electrodes you run a little more risk of having something go wrong so you have to balance the two but I, I think this is going to be an important uh, addition to the whole concept here but uh, it uh, is probably limited to some sophisticated audiologists who know how to handle the hearing aid and the implant together, because uh, that's a little bit more difficult. That, thank you very much. That was interesting. And just as a note, I didn't mean local anesthesia on the kids. I meant, obviously, on the medically fragile, maybe adults. But thank you. That was, that was great. Jan, so you have experienced programming children and adults. And you know times have changed, as I said before. And Tony Spore yesterday said, we used to spend hours programming a patient because it was an investigational device, and if we, they got some benefit, we hit the ceiling. And now it's more of a mainstream device. How has your time management changed over the years with adults? Let's talk about adults. Yeah, I was thinking about that as I was thinking, because I had no idea what questions Bill would ask. And I was thinking about how initially we would have hours to work up the patients. and. There were so many tests we had to do and the MAC battery and all of this stuff, and it would take hours. You could see maybe two patients a day. And now, obviously, things have changed, and there's productivity that we have to consider. Um, Jan, I'm just going to interrupt you for a second. Can you explain the MAC battery? Because there are probably a lot of people that don't know there was a MAC battery. So the MAC battery was written, I don't know, 25-plus 
years ago, and um, Dorcas Kessler was one of the original authors on it, and it had a series of different tests that looked at a variety of different things, like can a patient tell a question from a statement? Um, can they identify what numbers? Can they tell sentences? Um, and in order to qualify for implantation at that time, the patients had to have profound hearing loss, basically at all frequencies, so 90 dB and higher, and they had to score, I think, less than 20% on these CID sentences. Right. Um, <clears throat> and I remember I had a patient who had ushers, and she got like 22%, and we couldn't proceed with implantation, and it was really frustrating. Um, and so those tests, and they were all on cassette tapes, and you had <laughs> to find where you were on the cassette tape, and then maybe you could advance to a CD player, it was really time consuming. Everything was scored by hand, right? Um, and so now, centers do CI evaluations in, we get two hours for our evaluation. Some centers, I think, even have less time to do that. Um, and the testing is boiled down, right, down to essentially AZ Bio and CNC. And some centers do AZ Bio right off the bat at no in noise because really we want to think about what your CNC score is. So even though FDA is looking at AZ-Bio or sentence scores, not necessarily specifically AZ-Bio, we are moving much more towards looking at single syllable word scores and thinking about that as the criteria for implantation. So testing has really been distilled down um, quite a bit. And so now, obviously, we see much more patients, and we hope that we are a little bit more efficient in clinic um, in order to see more people and then do the counseling aspect as well. And, you know, thinking back to what Dr. Miyamoto was saying, you know, we would counsel so much about we didn't know what to predict, we didn't know what to expect, and now I think we have a lot more experience. and. It used to be that patients were happy if they could hear somebody cry, if somebody could tell the difference between a spondy and a trochee. That was a pretty big thing. Um, and now patients are coming in saying, you know, Beyonce doesn't sound like I expected her to. And I can't tell the difference between a trumpet and a trombone. And I keep thinking, holy cow, you can hear this. This is really exciting. And so. Patient expectations are very, very different, and obviously our counseling is a lot more about bimodal stimulation and what kind of phone do you have and do you want to stream into both ears or just one ear. It's a very different approach now. Um, anyway, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, that's great. So I remember when the pediatric investigational um, study was on, we were doing the worst patients we could possibly do, 12-year-old kids who you knew or we thought we knew wouldn't get as much benefit as the younger ones. Did you, do you remember that? This is a memory game. I, I do remember that. Um, and I remember my CFY when I was a clinical fellow at house with the single channel devices and we were implanting older kids and their performance was not great uh, for obvious reasons. And then we could only go down to age two at the time. And now we're implanting six months old, six month olds and the whole trajectory of their experience in their life is very different. And I think also, um, you know, to think about the rehab part, which is obviously key is in the therapy, is that even if you have a great surgeon, sometimes you can't achieve full insertion, but then if you have a good rehab team, these kids can go off to do exciting things and do very, very well with their devices. So it's, there's so many aspects to take into consideration um, when you think about, especially in planning the little kids. Right, I remember, I remember that when we were doing adults at the, uh, during the study, often they couldn't even hear the stimulus to, to know when to guess. And I kept saying, we have to finish this test, we have to finish this test, we can't leave anything blank. Do you remember that? I do remember that. It was painful. Really was painful. painful. Um, what about intraoperative monitoring? How has that changed over the years for you? Um, well, we used to go into the operating room and we used to run tests and whatnot, and now in our center it's all done remotely. Um, and so that certainly has been a time saver, other than it's a little challenging when you get the page and the clinicians, everybody's doing something else and you have to figure out 
excuse me, I need to step aside and run this test. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that's nice that we can do it all remotely. And what kind of tests do you do in the OR? We usually just run like an NRT, ART, NRI. And um, impedances. Impedances, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And sometimes I think I love having this data, and at the same time I think, what does it tell us, right? They're still going to close up, and rarely do they take out the device and go to the backup, but sometimes. Well, that's a good question. When would you, um, you know, you would talk to the surgeon, of course, who was in the OR. Are there ever times that you would pull a device out because you saw three shorts or, you know, something was going on, or you just kind of not do that? Well, Perhaps. I mean, it's a complex thing because it's not always a CI audiologist who's doing the testing. Um, and so sometimes they're just reporting back. And so, no, okay. you know, sometimes you need a different eye to say these are not just opens, these are shorts or something like that. Or, you know, impedance is high, maybe there's an air bubble, let's just sit and wait and see what happens. So, I mean, obviously it's a surgical call. So we just talked about objective testing in the OR, of course. So talk a little bit about how objective but has, has objective testing reached into the clinic as well? And what do you guys do? When would you use the, the ECAP measures or the, any other measures? We know SRT, ESRT seems to be even a more reliable measure for programming. Very, very difficult, I think, sometimes to achieve. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. I think that ESRT is a great tool to have in the toolbox. Um, obviously, it requires six hands from the clinician and it requires the kid to be papoosed and never move, which of course we achieve every time they come in. <laughs> um, so it can be really great, assuming that you have the equipment and that you have a, a mostly compliant individual. Right. Wouldn't it be great if the manufacturers could integrate that into the software somehow? It would be great, because it's very hard with so many hands. I right. mean, that we don't have as many hands right. as we need. And not every room is set up to make it easy. So, I mean, I think, you know, when you go to these conferences, you hear all these great ideas, and then I walk away saying, how can I physically, me, implement this? I don't have the desk, I don't have the seat, I don't have the video. How do you get this to happen so that you can get a patient in and out in the 60 or 90 minute slot that you have while you're still trying to get a probe in and while the kid's moving and crying and screaming and throwing <laughs> toys and, you know, there's what's a the lot problem? to what's manage. The, what's the problem? But that never happens in our clinics, right? Everybody's no. perfect. So we did talk a little bit about efficiency. So have you reduced the number of visits in the first year or you've been not doing that? How have things changed? We're having a lot of discussion and having taken the ICIT efficiency class and having, you know, the opportunity to talk to different clinicians at meetings such as this and picking up the phone. Um, we used to see people about six times in the first year, and I really want to reduce it because I don't think it's needed as much. I think that you can um, see patients with fewer visits. They have multiple programs that they can assess and address and change. They have a lot of access in their apps or their um, remotes that they can make their own changes, and then hopefully they'll report back. We're asking patients to rely a lot on the manufacturer concierges or whatever their designated title is, to do a lot of counseling pre, a lot of counseling post, um, and when patients have issues, to call them directly, because we're busy in clinic, right. and if they just you know, need a new X, Y, or Z, better they should deal with the manufacturer directly. So that's how we're starting to use that a right. lot more. So you're offloading some of the non-billable time to the manufacturers, and they're stepping up and taking care of that for you. Correct, and I used to love that part, and I really don't want to know somebody's phone. Right, but there's too much technology sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. You're an audiologist, that there's three companies, now that there's bimodal, well, patients, right? No one's supposed to leave your office without two implants or hearing aid in an implant unless they're SSD, right? You're looking at each ear individually and you're trying to figure out what's best, which brings a hearing aid into the room, and some audiologists are not that comfortable who have been doing cochlear implants for three decades programming hearing aids. So that makes it a little more difficult too, doesn't it? It does, it does. And then to make sure that you have all the equipment um, ideally in one place, right? You don't want to be moving a patient from the hearing aid room to the implant right. room to the booth. It's, it's right. you have to think about all of these efficiency aspects to try and streamline the patient. And then if you have an older patient who's non-ambulatory, you can't be moving them around to different locations. And then also if you have like an EAS device on one ear, there's a lot more things that you're measuring so maybe you have to do an audio at every visit to see if their hearing has changed. 
because then you have to think about how you might change the acoustic component in addition to the hearing aid and the implant and your crossover frequencies, and then how do you verify their settings? And there, there are economic issues, right? Cochlear implants covered by insurance. Hearing aid may not be. Then you have to see the patient for hearing aid adjustments. Do you build them? Do you not build them? Do you, do you charge them an upfront fee? Do you let another audiologist from another place that's referring patients to you see them? There are a lot of issues with, with bimodal technology. And we've all had that experience where we're going through all of these options and discussing it, and then they want to know the pricing. And I am looking forward to the day when we have somebody who will go over pricing with the recipient. Right now, it's still me. And then, of course, they can't hear. So you're typing all of this out, and then they need to review it, and then you're looking at your watch, and then they want to know, but if I get advanced bionics, then I get the, hear the hearing aid. But if I get cochlear, what do I do? And where do I go? And then what about this? And then you're thinking about the ear mold and the ear mold costs and the time frame and how do you sequence it? You know, and then they can't hear and then you, you know, you, you seem, know it, you live it. You seem a little stressed. <laughs> <laughs> that I say, is it time to quit? No, right, right, I mean, right. for the end of the day, not the career. Right. Um, my last quick question to you and then I'll leave you be telehealth. So how have you um, integrated telehealth into your, you know, because of the pandemic, we had to do a lot of telehealth, certainly with hearing aids. Have you done too much telehealth? Not as much as I would like, and I um, am looking forward to kind of revamping. I really like the idea of pre-visit telehealth so that when they come into the appointment, they actually know that this is something they want to pursue. I know that was discussed yesterday. Um, because the worst thing is when patients, you know, drive three and four hours to your clinic and you walk in and they say, I don't want surgery, and then they leave. Would have been so much better if they really understood because my first question to the patients is, do you know why you're here and what this appointment is for? And, you know, significant percentage don't know what the appointment is for or why they're here or what an implant is. And I think if we can explain that in advance through a televisit, where they can see your face, where there is captioning, where you can hold up a device and spend 20 minutes initially, that would save a whole lot more time farther on. So my plan is to utilize that much more frequently. And then other people I know have done even group um, virtual visits, anonymized in some way, where they can talk about the technology. And I think that that holds a lot of interesting idea for efficiency, time-saving, <coughs> building knowledge so that when the patient comes in, you can be much more efficient in your appointments. Thank you, that was great. Okay, so we're gonna move on to Ellen. And Ellen's got ex experience as a pediatric uh, speech and language pathologist. So I'm just gonna add, before you start, I'm just gonna talk about adult rehab a little bit, just quickly, as much as I know about it. I remember when we started, we didn't know that adults needed rehab. Um, we always said, well, kids need rehab, but we don't really know that adults need rehab. So years ago, we were a one speech SLP um, person seeing a few patients a day. Now we have two speech and language pathologists seeing up to 10 patients a day. Because now, when you tell a patient what has to be done, they do it. So when you tell them, yes, the hearing therapist is going to be part of this whole process, and here's your appointment for the hearing therapist, patients do it. But we didn't tell them to do it back then, and now we do. So that's changed a lot at our center for adult rehab. So um, some questions for you. Um, talk about the age you see kids. How, how has it changed? How has the age and implant changed over time? That's one of the biggest areas of change probably is the age. Uh, and what, who is a candidate. Um, both have changed a lot. When I started in the field, uh, we were working with kids who were three, four, five, six, primarily. That was the bulk of the day was kids in that age range. And now the majority of the children I work with on a day-to-day -day, um, basis are two and a half and under. So there's been a really big shift. And you know, when we started, there was no newborn hearing screening. So we weren't finding the children until they were three or four. and. Now we have that in place so that people know early on if their child was born with a significant hearing loss. And it's made my job so much easier. 
uh, we can just really work into the normal developmental pattern and the neuroplasticity is there and it's been great for me because my job got a whole lot easier. <laughs> so <coughs> is, are you an EI center, early intervention center? I'm part of a great team and the clinic is actually adult and pediatric. Uh, and so I do have patients that run the gamut, um, but where we put our focus because we do have to prioritize to some extent because there just aren't enough of us, um, is in the early newly activated kids with implants. Uh, we have s the understanding of what it takes to be successful has really been organized and um, defined and we have so much more ability to access information about what it takes for a child to be successful that we can really see who if we have to pick, should we put our first efforts into? And that is typically the young child that's newly activated. We've been able to partner with speech language pathologists in the greater community to help serve older kids that don't need their professional to have as much understanding of how audition develops as ideally you do if you're working with a very young child. What's your feeling about a child who is diagnosed, has meningitis at a very, very young age, and now they have a hearing loss and you need to get the device in as quickly as possible? Hearing aid, no hearing aid, um, what would you say? It's, it's, and it, 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 I, case by case could be yeah. a good answer as well. Well, it's an interesting question because my very first implant patient was post-meningitic in 1991 when implants were relatively new for kids. She was six. She'd had hearing, she went home for Christmas break, developed meningitis, and by the first of the year was profound. We had to do a very, very painful six month hearing aid trial. And that was some of the most frustrating intervention I've had to do because it was so clear it wasn't working. So in the case of a young child who has meningitis, I'm gonna look for guidance from the the surgeon as to what they think, but from a speech and language perspective, I'm go when we can, because right. that's our best prognosis. Good answer. So that th brings us to the comorbidity story. Maybe when you have meningitis, you have other issues going on. So how, do you, how differently do you treat those patients from a speech and language point of view? What do you do that might be different? Those patients definitely can have comorbidities. And then you know, one of the themes of this conference is CMV, and those patients definitely have comorbidities. And I think we all know that autism rates have risen, um, and we're implanting these very young children, and we don't always know what other comorbidities are gonna exist, what's gonna show up as time goes on, which can make counseling different. But I, you know, and we start at the same spot. We know what it takes for a child to develop audition and learn to listen and learn to talk. And so we start with working on the pathways to the brain for that sound to become meaningful. And even children with significant comorbidities can often do very well in terms of developing audition. I have a few uh, patients with cerebral palsy where their understanding is great. They're not able to speak in a traditional manner, but we develop the hearing, we develop the understanding, and so their ability to use an alternative means of communication is then much more effective too. Uh, and sometimes it, I, I had one child where the mother was just happy because the child was calm when he could hear her. She said, until the cochlear implant, I could not leave this child's sight without him becoming so agitated and distressed. So what is success? You know, it's always gonna vary depending on the picture, but I think there's a lot to offer the array of kids with other comorbidities in getting an implant.
you bring up a, an interesting topic about success, because how many uh, in parents or patients say, how successful is that? Right? You hear that all the time. So what does that mean? I have a perfect story, I think, for that. We had a 75-year-old lady who could not lip read at all. So when you communicated with her, you had to write things down, couldn't communicate at all. Once she got an implant, she didn't have open set discrimination, but the information she got from the implant in conjunction with the lip reading, she was able to function. So we consider that a success, she wore her implant. By the same token, we had a guy who was a musician who had open set discrimination and didn't want to wear his device because he didn't like the way music sounded. So what does success mean, right? So question for you about telehealth. Um, how do you do it? When do you do it? How does bimodal, uh, a, a bimodal patient, uh, how do you work with telehealth with bimodal patients? Just talk a little bit about your experience with telehealth. Well, I think it's the one good thing to come out of COVID, maybe. <laughs> um, also, Michigan... tra tra less traffic for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Michigan is a very big state. And we are one of the few centers in the state that accepts Michigan Medicaid. So our families often travel really long distances. I mean, it, it could be 500 miles from the Upper Peninsula to our center. And so the ability for these patients to participate regularly in intervention, it just wasn't there. And the opening of the door to telehealth let us reach this wider geographic area. And it also gave busy parents a lot more flexibility. Our no-show cancellation rate, so anybody who either didn't show for their appointment or canceled in less than 24 hours ahead of the appointment, went from 18% to 9% when the parents were able to choose the service delivery option, whether they wanted to come in person or whether they wanted to do virtual. And they could, they could choose. They could do virtual one week and then do three in-persons and then do virtual again. And this reduced the number of absences really considerably. And it, we all understand, we're all working professionals. Sometimes the juggling gets hard. And if you have to dedicate three hours for an appointment, that's a lot different than if you have to dedicate one. So I think it's been a wonderful tool in terms of opening up that kind of uh, availability. Thank you. So Donna, we're going to talk to you for a little bit. So you have the advantage, I think, of having a dual perspective. You're the ED of the ACIA, and you're also a patient. Um, so why don't you talk to us a little bit about your hearing journey? Indeed, but I didn't, I didn't come to this um, intervention with any information at all. Um, Probably you don't know my history, but I was um, born with, um, we think, uh, some limited hearing loss. And it was picked up in elementary school. We used to test th through 8,000 hertz. And we don't do that in most schools anymore. So they used to pick my loss up in elementary school. And I was normal through 4,000. And then it declined after that. So. We didn't really do anything about it. We didn't do anything for kids um, with that kind of hearing loss at the time. Um, I, I did have some familiarity because my father um, had adult onset hearing loss and used hearing aids um, the entire, his entire adult life. Um, so I did, you know, I did pretty fine until I hit my 20s. And then my hearing started to change um, quite rapidly. I, I had a number of cool strategies that I would use to compensate for it. If I was talking to a group like this uh, and people had a question, I would walk into the audience to take the question. And people thought I was being very interactive, but I was really just getting close enough to be able to read their lips and hear what they were saying. Um, so those kinds of strategies worked for a while. Um, I did use hearing aids um, in my 20s with very limited success. I had an audiogram that looked like this, and that was in the analog days when we couldn't fit people very well. 
So hearing aids actually were quite painful for me. And I would wear them when I had a meeting and I needed to hear and then I would take them off um, before I would uh, always um, try to have uh, not much going on before or after a meeting. Um, I used to have a consulting firm actually and worked with different groups. Um, imagine me working with 10 or 12 people around a table with no support. You know, this was before the ADA, before we had the internet, before we had the ability to use email. Um, and so you had the telephone, <laughs> which I had lost um, pretty quickly. So the one wonderful thing that I had going for me was my audiologist, um, who at the time was way better than some of our audiologists today. And she had just fit me with the most high-tech hearing aids that existed. And she said, you know, I've done everything that I can for you, and you're still not doing very well. I think you should explore a cochlear implant. So this was 1992, how advanced she was. And she gave me the names of patients who had gone and gotten cochlear implants. Um, and I spoke to them, and I think it was Jan that said the expectations were fairly low at the time. But I didn't care because my words and sentences scores were zero. So I had no fear of losing my residual hearing. For whatever reason, I didn't have any of the fears of surgery that we do hear about today, Bill, that you talked about. Um, and I was also lucky to have an internist who helped me determine where to go. Because again, no internet. Where did you get your information? You couldn't go to the ACI Alliance website and click on find a cochlear implant clinic, click on your state, and then figure out where to go. You, for information, we went to the library, right, and looked in books. So there, there wasn't much to guide me. But my internist um, actually made calls. And he found Johns Hopkins, which at the time was the big center in the region. He called Sean DeParco, who was the main surgeon there at the time, had a conversation with him, and that was my entrance into cochlear implantation. And I went to Hopkins, and my time frame from my first appointment with Karen Young, some of you may remember Karen, who was um, an early audiologist, um, and with John, um, until my surgery was 75 days. So we were talking yesterday about people who were talking about 150 days being a, a, a good time frame start to finish. Mine was 75 days. And the reason it didn't go faster than that um, was that my surgeon was concerned I wouldn't get insurance in time. You know, and so we, I had a promontory. Remember promontory stimulation? I had that done. Um, and that was pretty cool because I actually could hear. And so I, you know, that, that to me was a, was a positive. And I remember sitting up from the promontory and John saying to me, we can do either ear. Um, why don't you think of, go home and think about it. I said, I, you don't need to think about it. Just schedule the surgery. And so we did. And we did the surgery 10 days after I had the promontory. Um, and it, for me, it was an extraordinary experience quite quickly. Um, if I can just do one more thing before Bill asks me a question. Um, A.V., could you put up the slide that I have? I have one slide. So um, this was me in 2004, and that was, do you remember Parade Magazine? It used to be this magazine that they would insert in newspapers, and they did um, an article on cool new hearing devices, um, and that was the cover of Parade in that year. And look at what I was wearing, a body-worn device. That was actually my second body-worn. And to use the phone, which I used quite well, 
I would uh, go from my device with this plug-in thing into the phone and I could hear, I didn't care. You know, we talk about, you know, the fact that people don't like the big devices and whatever, that was actually uh, the second device really improved my hearing. And it's a wonderful thing to say to people that without a surgery, you can continue to upgrade. I say that all the time. I'm now on my seventh sound processor, and each time we get a benefit. So now when I want to use the phone, as you all know, you just use Bluetooth. You hold your phone up with your cell phone, and it's just like everybody else. So in some ways, it's really helped us with these advances in the technology and all three companies have, um, as Mario said, they all mimic what everybody else is doing. So all three companies have provided these wonderful benefits in terms of what we are able to access to hear better in, in different situations. I was told at the time I wouldn't like music, you know, it, and then I think of the young man that opened our conference today singing what is a actually rather difficult score to do. Um, and I, I, I didn't care, I just wanted to talk on the phone. You can take this off, by the way, A.V. Um, my mom wanted to talk to me on the phone. Um, and so I was visiting with um, Chuck Berlin. How many of you knew Chuck Berlin, wonderful audiologist uh, at LSU? who worked with a lot of musicians, and Chuck asked me if I liked music, and I said, nah, you know, I can't do music. So he sat me down at a keyboard and played different instruments and had me identify them, and I got them all right. And that was when I realized that, wow, maybe I really could enjoy music. So that was an unexpected perk that I had and really have have enjoyed and loved. It's not the same for sure. And I used to play um, an instrument, um, but it certainly is something that has, adv has advanced so much since 1992 in terms of all of us recognizing that this is an additional benefit of this extraordinary device. Thank you very much, that was great. We have maybe a minute left. With that minute, I'm wondering if anyone would kind of hypothesize or postulate about the future. What would they like to see in the future? And whoever wants to, to say something. Yeah, I think, you know, probably the biggest thing is to continue on the awareness um, element and the fact that we still have to deal with unfortunately audiologists and even ENTs who don't recognize when to refer someone. Right. And it was so different for me. I had an audiologist who essentially pushed me forward and I probably would have made it there eventually, but it would have taken a couple of more years. So I think that aspect is something we, we all work on. And then what I talked about this morning when we opened the the fact that there are some groups that continue to tell families that this isn't going to provide your child with the benefit that they need and you need to start with ASL right away. And so that's, that's something that I think we perhaps haven't been very adept at addressing, perhaps because we're always trying to be careful and politically correct. Um, and that's why the messaging effort that we did that really is very positive and just talks about literacy and parents doing what they know how to do. Um, hopefully we'll all pick up and it will be successful. Thank you. Anyone else want to make a comment? I have a prediction that relates to something that was discussed before. Uh, I would say in 10 or 20 years, uh, CI audiologists are going to disappear. There's not going to be any more of them. Why? Because they're going to become audiologists. Uh, I think in our field, we had this unfortunate separation into separate silos, which made sense in the 80s, right? Because you had completely deaf patients who were uh, candidates for cochlear implantation and or people who could benefit from amplification with very little overlap. 
I remember the first time in my lab that I had to test someone who had some residual hearing, I was somewhat annoyed because it was going to take more work on interpreting the data and so on. But then that became more and more common. Um, in the meantime, uh, we developed into two separate fields with, like Bill said, some people have been fitting cochlear implants for 30 years and may not know that much about amplification and certainly vice versa. Uh, so that's uh, what I think is going to change because if you are a bimodal patient, having one clinician for each ear is like having knee problems and having, seeing, having to see a left knee specialist and a right knee specialist. That's clearly suboptimal. So that's my prediction. Good Let's point. meet again in 10, 20 years Good and see point. what happens. Anyone else have any predictions they want to talk about? Maybe like a totally implantable device would be nice. What do you think? Okay, I guess we'll end with that. Thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. They were great. Thank you to the audience.